Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from The Bunker and in this video we will be going through a who's who on the governing body. I say we, I am joined, I'm delighted to say, by Phil from the Blue Envelope channel and Jay from the aptly named Jay the Comedian channel. Phil What's and up, Jay. Everybody? <laughs> Hello, Thank hello. you for joining me in lockdown, no less. In the midst of a pandemic, you are still doing your service to the That's XJW right. community. I've been locked down in better places than this. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, seriously, it's, um, it's good of you to set aside some time, albeit you're kind of a captive audience, aren't you, I suppose, in, due to circumstances, but it's nevertheless nice of you to uh, go through this with me. And Phil, obviously, this is sort of what you do on your channel anyway. So um, if viewers haven't already checked out the Blue Envelope channel, there will be a link in the description. Phil, can you run us through what you've already managed to do in terms of research projects? Oh, sure. Uh, well, let's see. I've done a little bit. I started off with uh, Anthony Morris from The Governing Body and did a couple of videos on him. Just That's, that's just an obvious one to start with, isn't it? You know? <laughs> it was. <laughs> you, it was a just favorite. Got, you, got, you could write volumes on that man, couldn't you, in fairness? <laughs> indeed, indeed, yes. How so much I, drinking I, was involved in that research? <laughs> <laughs> Not research as much for killing as needed. Brilliant. <laughs> so you've, yeah. you started with Tony Morris. Tony Morris, yep. And then uh, I did one a little while back on Mark Sanderson. And uh, most recently, I uh, was talking, looking at Steve Lett, Stephen Lett a little bit more. Sure. The face himself. R all rubber face. <laughs> so we're going to try and summarize some of your research on Stephen Lett in this video, because what I've decided to do, I've decided to do a two-parter. There are currently as we speak in 2020, if you're watching this in the future, uh, first of all, well done for surviving. Um, <laughs> but there are currently eight members of the governing body at this point in 2020, and we're going to go through them alphabetically. And the first four we are going to discuss are Kenneth Cook, Samuel Hurd, Jeffrey Jackson, and Stephen Lett. And I will be putting... Um, the timestamps in the description below. So if you want to jump straight to a particular governing body member, then go to the description, click on the timestamp. You can whiz straight to that particular gentleman. So <laughs> let's start off. It's my turn to start and we'll start with Kenneth Cook. Now you sent me some information, Phil, uh, indicating that he might have been born in 1961. Is that the date we're going with? That's, that's at least in the ballpark for sure. That's what I was coming up with. Sure. Because he doesn't actually... It's interesting how when you, you do the research, obviously when we say research, this is actually from Watchtower Publications, but some governing body members seem to be quite sheepish about letting it be known what year they're born. Um, but 1961, as the date for Kenneth Cook, actually works out quite well, because what we do know is that apart from being born and raised in South Central Pennsylvania, USA, he was indoctrinated by a classmate, he would say brought into the truth. He was indoctrinated by a classmate just prior to graduating high school, that tends to happen around the ages of, I don't know, 17, 18. Correct me if I'm wrong, gentlemen, in you America. the worst choices of your life. Yeah, that's about accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and um, actually, there is this footage now, um, which I can share with you from the 2019 annual meeting in which he describes going to his first ever meeting. What a student sees at our meetings may touch his heart and help him to progress. Very early on, show the video, what happens at a kingdom hall? Then warmly invite him to attend with you, appeal to him, also offer transportation if it is needed. I really appreciated getting a ride to the first meeting that I attended, and I still remember it. 
So this apparently would have happened. It, it makes sense if he was born in 1961 for this to have happened around about 1980 uh, because it was actually June 7th, 1980 that he was baptized and that would put him at the age of 19 when he was baptized if he was born in 1961. So let's go with 1961. And uh, if any subsequent information comes to light contradicting that, I'll try and put it as a note in the video description. Have you ever done anything you regret at 19 years old? <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? I mean, good grief. You, you, you're not really the finished article, are you? At any point up to, let's say, your mid-20s. You're, you're kind of a work in progress. So to commit yourself to anything, although it must be said that 1819 is still, is still fairly late to be indoctrinated into the organization without having had it pummeled into you from infancy. So you, you could argue he could have known better, but then again, he was being lied to, wasn't he? He was being deceived. This is how cult indoctrination works. Yeah, since I was born in, I was unlucky enough to get baptized at 12 years old. 12, wow. Yeah. What was, age were you, Phil? Uh, 12 years old. Oh, can, man, me and Phil, yeah, we both dumb. <laughs> I can beat you both. I'll see you're 12, and I'll raise you 11. So, oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's right. Not, Shutting it down there straight away. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he's baptized at... 19 we think on uh, june 7th june 7th 1980 september 1st 1982 wasting no time there he begins pioneer service and after just two years of pioneering he starts Bethel service october 12th 1984 uh, working in the printery and the Bethel office now here's the thing uh, jay and phil i don't know what you think but when I was pioneering, it was always like a temptation in the back of my mind to get out of the dreariness of pioneering by, oh, I'm going to go to Bethel, I'm going to be working in the house of God, and at least I won't have to trudge around people's houses. Do you think that might have played some part in his decision making there? For sure. That was my exact train of thought. I, I never liked pioneering so much. It was the road to Bethel. Yeah. <laughs> Was the plan anyway? <laughs> well, I, I, I never, I never pioneered. I'm gonna be honest with you. I absolutely hated field service. I never liked any part of it. So I definitely, but and, but I, funny enough, I did consider going to Bethel. Of course, I knew the steps I would have to take to get there, and the least of which was be pioneering. So I'm like, oh, I don't know how I'm gonna figure that out. But the reason I wanted to go to Bethel is because. Whenever somebody in my neighborhood or my kingdom hall went to Bethel, they were considered almost like celebrities in my congregation. It was like, oh, you're going to Bethel? Or like I hear mothers, oh, my son's going to Bethel. Or, or you know, he, I'm like, wow, I, I want to be a celebrity kind of. Maybe I should go to Bethel. And, you know, I thought you go to Bethel, you make a ton of money. And, you know, you, you're on the high road to becoming one of like the service members or something. You know, like. That I always used to think that. Uh, I learned a lot afterwards. <laughs> but mm. yeah, I, I kind of wanted to go to Bethel, but I guess for selfish reasons. Yeah, I, I think, look, if you're going to pioneer, two years to me suggests, okay, year one, you get your pioneer school. And he's literally just pioneered for one year after pioneer school. So it seems to me to be want, knowing precisely what route he wants to take, it seems at least. Um, 1996, he marries his wife, Jamie. Uh, 2009, December, he transfers to Patterson. It's a little bit unclear where he is when he starts in 1984. I'm going to guess it was Brooklyn, but it could have been wall kill that part is unclear from the article that i was reading which is the article where it's announced that he's become a governing body member uh, so he transfers to patterson in 2009 begins working for the correspondence department now this was an interesting one i don't know what you guys thought 
But when you work on the correspondence department, you are, shall we say, more exposed than perhaps in other departments to TAT. You're going to have a lot of letters inbound where people are complaining about child abuse, complaining about shunning, bringing up United Nations, bringing up Mexico, Malawi. If you can get through that assignment and develop a reputation, as it were, for putting out fires, that's a pretty good start. Well, I always look at it as, if you can get through that stuff and you mm. still remain a Jehovah Witness, <laughs> it's like, wow, you know all of our secrets and you're not going anywhere? All right, yeah, come on. You can take a step up. <laughs> it seems like an obvious tick in the box if, if your trajectory is aiming towards governing body. Would you agree, Phil? I, I would say so. That's a definite mm. box to check. Obviously, we're not told what his wife was doing. We can only assume not the correspondence department um <laughs> almost certainly something fairly menial you know we can only assume um 2016 april he's transferred to brooklyn again i don't know whether that was back to brooklyn um or to brooklyn for the first time but he wasn't there for long because as we all know um the fall of 2016 saw the Brooklyn Bethel family transfer over to Warwick. And 2018, January the 24th, takes us to him being announced as a governing body member. And I can only say that when I heard the announcement, it came as a total surprise, only because even though by that point I was fairly familiar with quite a few names of governing body helpers, his wasn't one of them. His was one where I don't think at that point he'd even appeared on camera. So we didn't even really know what he looked like. Um, and since then, he's obviously appeared on JW Broadcasting. He's appeared on a few morning worships. He was on, obviously, the 2019 annual meeting, unveiling the, uh, the year text for 2020. And maybe I'm being unkind here, guys, but for me, he's not a very um, charismatic speaker. He, he doesn't exude sort of personality. He kind of has the appearance and stage presence of an accountant, quite frankly. Um, maybe I'm being unkind. This is one of those moments where I would just love to be a fly on the wall to those other guys that you did know about. Because they, I'm, I'm sure they're like, what? Him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even know do I even know him. I'm, I'm the one out here taking all the punches and stuff. M Mark Newmare going, damn you, Kenneth <laughs> Cook, damn you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have I been unkind, though, in characterizing him? I mean, I just, I find his presentations incredibly tedious. Not really much to, to talk about. I, which I suppose is a welcome change from the likes of Stephen Lett and Anthony Morris, but he's certainly not got a very compelling way of speaking, in my view. No, I, I would agree. I think he kind of got there more by just climbing up the corporate ladder a little bit. And you kind of see that with Mark Sanderson, too, when we get to him next time, that not, right, not so much the charisma was what got him there. I'm wondering whether that's a little bit deliberate, though, because you, men you mentioned Mark Sanderson. Um, you could argue the same thing is true that I said about Kenneth Cook, kind of looking and sounding like an accountant. In a, in a way, the same is true of Mark Sanderson. Mark Sanderson, for me, has got a more compelling, slightly more seemingly heartfelt way of talking but he's still fairly predictable. I mean, I'm working on, as we speak, I'm working on my rebuttal to his latest JW Broadcasting. And for, the, for large parts, you can just skip right through it because all he's doing is just regurgitating stuff that we already know. And I'm wondering whether this kind of predictability, this sort of plainness and ordinariness is almost deliberate because if you have characters who are long-standing members of the governing body, they're not going to want to be outshone by newcomers. So maybe it's like a bonus point 
if you're a prospective governing body member, if you're fairly plain, fairly ordinary, and don't really stand out. Would that be fair? Oh, I would agree with that 100%. There's certain, when you come in, especially when you're a new guy, there's obviously probably some nerves there. I'm sure they don't want to step on any toes and they don't want to, you know, like take over or whatever. But then, yeah, I'm sure that, like certain, because as much as people probably don't want to want to admit it, the governor body on certain levels have a little bit of pridefulness, you know? They don't want to be shown up or anything like that. It, it shown by a, my good friend Sam Hurd when he when he went to the uh, the convention and they, he was all dancing a little bit. You know, they they enjoy the stardom a little bit, you know. So I I'm not surprised that they 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 would still want to be the headliners. You know what I mean? Like they 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 show it a little bit from time to time, and um. And yeah, yeah, they, they'll pick somebody who's like, yeah, he's no threat. You know, he's gonna he's gonna play the role. He's gonna do what we tell him, and you know, he's not a threat. So I can absolutely one hundred percent see that. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but that's just I can imagine that being the basic psychology that goes on. Uh, if you do have a narcissistic group of leaders who want to hog the limelight, you're going to feel less threatened if people who are coming into your group are fairly ordinary and nothing much to write home about. Um, but you mentioned Samuel Hurd. That takes us to our next governing body member, alphabetically. Uh, Phil, what can you tell us about Samuel Hurd? Yeah, well, Sam, he's an interesting fella. Um, so fortunately, he had a very extensive uh, Life Story article in the 2018 Watchtower. So that gives us a pretty good amount of info on him. Um, but yeah, Sam, he was born around 1935 in uh, Indiana, USA. So I guess that would put him about 85 years old now. And uh, yeah, he's born during the Great Depression, very poor family that he, he, he was number four out of seven kids in his family. Born in a lo one room log cabin. Um, As you do. And <laughs> yeah. I read about that. It was quite dramatic in the story, describing being having was it six siblings, all crammed into a, a one room log cabin. That can't have been comfortable. I agree. <laughs> and he mentions too a little interesting tidbit about his dad that his dad was quite a bit older. Um, his dad was fifty six when he was born, whereas his mom was only thirty five. So. Um, I was just kind of kicking around that if his dad was that old in, in 1935, he would have been born in 1879, the year oh, the Watchtower oh, started being published. Good catch, Phil. Good catch. <laughs> wow. So I don't know. Yeah. Wow. Does, that, does that mean that uh, Sam Hurd is the same generation as Charles Taze Russell? Evidently, brothers. <laughs> Evidently, that's exactly what it means. I can't think of more compelling evidence for that. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I can tell you from uh, from my neighborhood, whenever we see Sam Hurd, because, like, of course, I went to a predominantly uh, black kingdom hall, and, and, you know, I lived in a predominantly black neighborhood. Sam Hurd was the the one guy, we're like, look, we have a, a black governor body member. Look at that. You know what I mean? Like, and it was, it, everybody, I promise you, this was said a lot, and this is from active Jehovah Witnesses. We we're like, okay, they put them there, you know, you know, they kind of had to, you know. I heard that so often in, in my kingdom hall, and, and this is not like from people who left organization. This is people inside the organization who were kind of like, uh, yeah, Sam, yeah, yeah, Governor Body, yeah. Uh-huh. And and I always found that quite funny and quite interesting. But um and even like even in his picture, the governor body picture, he's the one person with like the different color suit on than everybody else. Uh, he's always been just a very, very interesting character to me. And uh and the black Jehovah Witnesses that I grew up with. We always looked at him and we would just point out, yeah, see this organization. It's, it's, it's nothing racist about it. Everybody's uh, loving and and look, they, we even have a black governor body member, so this makes everything okay. And you know, it was uh, he's always been one of the most interesting governor body members to me personally. Which is potentially the conclusion you were supposed to draw 
potentially <laughs> when he was selected. I'm just going to put that out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you were telling us about um, Sam's parents, Phil. Indeed. Indeed. So, right. So he wasn't uh, raised as a witness. His family was Baptist when he was young. Um, he, he mentions he had a little stint as a boxer in his high school years. Um, but he says, I wasn't very good. So he kind of pulled the plug on that. But he did do a few bouts, which is interesting, given the fact that professional boxing, at least, is a disfellowshipping offense. Um, obviously, he wasn't a witness at the time, but it's nonetheless interesting that that forms part of his story. Indeed. Indeed. So after that, he, um, after he graduated high school, he was uh, drafted. This was the period from World War II to Vietnam. Everybody had to, there was, the draft was going on. So he was in the army from uh, 54 to 56, uh, over in Germany mainly. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The, there's actually an interesting quote there from the article. And there's a similar quote that we'll come to um, when we're doing Jeffrey Jackson, every now and then laced within these guys' stories is like a needless piece of information that seems to have inserted, seems to have been inserted for no other reason than to impress people. So we get it. He was drafted into the army and served in Germany for two years, but he just had to mention in his story, while I was serving there, that's in Germany, my superior sent me to a non-commissioned officer's academy thinking that I had natural leadership abilities. <laughs> they wanted me to make the military my career. And he goes on to say that, you know, it, it, basically their plans didn't work. But that just seems to me to be a needless piece of information. I, I'm sure that all three of us would would there are things about what happened during his time in the army that we, we would be more interested in than that piece of information. But he seems to have put it in to impress people that even at that stage in his life, people were looking at him and pointing the finger and saying, this guy's a leader, you know? Yeah, I want to hear the story about how he led his platoon against the Germans and raided the, like, like well... No, uh, it wasn't like, in World War II, Jay. He, he wasn't storming the Normandy beaches. Oh, was, oh, okay, my bad. Let's just, yeah, <laughs> for the purpose of being factual, it was, <laughs> was it 54 to, uh, yeah, 54 he was drafted in and 50, 56 he was honorably discharged, so... The war was over by that point, Jay. Oh, okay, I guess. <laughs> it's three. He was getting all excited there, thinking about I was. I was thinking about Tony Morris, because I know Tony was like, yeah, I was on the battlefield. <laughs> you were imagining <laughs> Sam Hurt storming Hitler's bunker, presumably, for a moment there. But yeah, that didn't happen, unfortunately. Oh, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> so anyway, Phil, yes. we move on. <laughs> Yes, indeed. So he did his time and uh, came back. It sounds like he came back home to Indiana again there. Uh, he mentions he bought a red convertible that he liked to drive around town. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, that's where he first ran into the witnesses in town there. So his, one of his sisters had married this fella. So, and his, so this fellow was his brother-in-law. And then two of the sisters of this guy uh, were witnesses. And they're the ones that first you know, they invited him to the book study and he attended. And that's kind of how is he got into the, the witness religion. Uh, and it sounds like he took off from there. He says nine months later, he was baptized. Um, so that would have been around uh, March of 57, he got baptized. It sounds a little bit to me, though, when you read between the lines, like he was seduced into the religion. He was, he was approached by two young witness ladies one of whom was Gloria, who he ended up marrying. So you're not telling me that there weren't any sort of carnal impulses going on in, it, when he was sat there in his red convertible chatting to these witness ladies who were inviting him to a meeting. You're not telling me that that played no part, you know. Just find exactly. That How do you go from red drop-top Sammy to baptized Samuel Hurd in nine months? Like, there had to be something else there, you know? I think Gloria might have been persuasive in more than just the theology she was encouraging. 
Oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that I guess I could throw in. He has this little uh, cheesy joke about Gloria there, and it's so much reminds me of things my dad would say over the years. These jokes that he would say, you know, a thousand times. My mom would kind of roll her eyes after a while, but <laughs> he says Gloria was a jewel then, and she is a jewel today. To me, she is like the Hope Diamond, but I don't have to hope in this case. I married her. Jay, do you say similar words, sweet words to your beloved? Uh, sometimes I do. <laughs> but, she's in, but she's an earshot, of course. <laughs> she's a diamond and she's the greatest thing ever, you know? <laughs> but uh, it, it just, I've seen this happen before where um, somebody who who will be preaching, of course, they'll end up having to transfer their Bible study over to a male uh, 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 overseer of the Bible study. But they they give them the wink and the nod, you know, yeah, come on, join, and yeah, and event, it works. I've seen it happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that 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 happens, and I can see him now. Uh, I wonder if he still got that red drop top, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness knows whether that's in a Bethel parking lot somewhere. I, I would imagine that's no longer in his possession, but it may be in the in the museum. It's going to come maybe. in the museum one day. <laughs> in a, in a spiritual heritage museum, one day that will. <laughs> um, so, 1959, he marries Gloria. Phil, he does. Yep, and uh, he says they applied to Bethel almost immediately because uh, they had just started taking married couples there recently. But uh, he found out that you needed quite a bit of seniority to, uh, to do that. Um, I thought it was kind of just a little random trivia that he interviewed with this brother, Simon Craker, uh, to go to Bethel. And interestingly, because Simon Craker's his life stories and published as well. And he also got married in 1959. But that was the difference was he and his wife had like 100 years seniority at Bethel already. So they could stay. Yeah, that, that actually reminds me of something, too. Um, I remember there were, like, certain women at my kingdom hall who didn't enjoy the dating pool at my kingdom hall, and they had, like, somebody they would like, but they weren't Jehovah Witnesses. So they would actively go extremely hard to make sure they were brought into the congregation. And, and yeah, it, 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 that's, that's another way that dating would take place, at least in my congregation. Uh, sisters would not like the dating pool. They'd find somebody outside of the organization, and they'd do their darnest to get them to come in. And uh, is that what happened with Sam Hurd? <laughs> are, you, are you telling us, Jay, that sisters in your congregation didn't like the pick of men in your congregation, even though you were in the congregation? Is this a especially, moment of brutal honesty on your part? Especially because I was in the congregation. I probably drove <laughs> <him> away. <laughs> like, really? This guy is nuts. This is the best we can do. I got to do better. <laughs> so, cool. so what confuses me, um, Phil, is he, he winds up at some point, some heard, doing circuit overseer work. And with the, there's that um, audio which I'm sure you, you know about, which surfaced in Leah Ramini's aftermath, um, of him saying incredibly sexist things about the cranial capacity of women being smaller, and therefore they're just not cut out for leadership. Um, what can you tell us about this part of his life where he's, he's not quite at Bethel yet, he's doing the circuit work? Yeah, that, how interesting is that? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so they, they were uh, pioneering out, out west there in Arkansas. And uh, yeah, so I mean, to give some background, this whole, the whole civil rights movement was really taken off in that period of the 60s, Martin Luther King Jr. And, and then on kind of the coattails of that, you had the, the women's rights or feminism was, you know, women were saying, hey, maybe we should be treated equally too. And uh and that's kind of when you see the so the article in the awake about women having smaller brains and all this crazy stuff was I think that was in 1967 they published that, and then a few years later uh, I think JW Fax puts it at 71 was when Sam gave that <laughs> infamous talk, which I'm sure he now regrets. <laughs> 
given just, the fact that it's been on national television. You know, scientists say that the cranial capacity of a woman is 10% smaller than that of a man. So now this shows that she's just not equipped for the role of headship. Her role is one of subjection to the man. Her role is that of submissiveness, and that means that she should recognize that she is a woman and be glad to be a woman. Never want to be what you are not equipped. But we'll hear a sister say, oh, if I were an elder, I'd show them a thing or two. Or sometimes we hear them say, oh, if, if, if I were a man, I'd do this and I'd do that. As if to be wishing to be something that he's not desired to be. Do you know what that borders on? That borders on homosexuality. And you know what the devil is doing nowadays? He's taking women who want to be men. He makes men out of them. You know what else he's doing? He's taking men who want to be women, and he's making women out of them. And it's spreading. It's not a little thing. But homosexuality is something that is spreading, and it's all over the earth. It's not just here, in San Francisco and Oakland, but it's everywhere. But it all begins with a thought. Somewhere, individuals have wanted to be what they are not designed to be. And they've nurtured that. So never voice the thought of wanting to be what you're not cut out to be. Be glad to be what you are, woman. Your role in the earth is a beautiful role that Jehovah God has placed you in. <laughs> I always wonder if he ever, like, you know, his wife got mad at him and he'd come home. <laughs> and he basically just say, hey, honey, did you take care of this? And then she's like, oh, I'm sorry. My small mind forgot to take care of that, honey. <laughs> like, <laughs> and just throw it in his face because there's no way I would ever get away with saying that about a woman. I have nine sisters, so <laughs> I would get punched right in my face if I made any suggestion that because they have a smaller head, that they're somehow less intelligent or less capable of doing things. Because if it was that, if that was true, why don't elephants rule the world? Because they have the biggest head on the planet. <laughs> I just I just don't get that line of thinking at all. Well, what's interesting, I don't know whether you noticed this, Phil, um, but when you read Sam Hurd's life story, there's there's kind of hints in it that he's kind of rather preoccupied or at least at some point in his life, was preoccupied with the concept of, of being macho, of men being macho. He didn't like... I'm just trying to find the quote here. Here we are. Um, under the heading, A New Life Begins, it says, Up to this point in my life, I had learned to be somewhat macho. The idea of what a man should be, as presented in the movies and the social environment influenced me a great deal to my way of thinking preachers were not manly enough um but i began to learn some things that turned my life around and he goes on to say that um he, he came to consider that oh that's right and um, when i think about my old macho attitude i am glad that i learned what the bible teaches about real manliness Jesus was a perfect man. He had strength and physical power that would make any macho man pale in comparison, yet he did not get involved in fights, but he let himself be afflicted just as was foretold. I don't know. It, even when he's kind of explaining how he corrected his thinking, he's still kind of hinting at this preoccupation with you know, manliness and being macho and butch, um, which, I don't know, it, it seems fairly irrelevant, quite honestly. Indeed. It, it just struck me as like a huge blind spot he seems to have because so much of his life story is about encountering racism and segregation and, you know, trying to overcome that justifiably. So, of course, mm. but then when it comes to women and men being equal, he's pulling out these arguments about, well, they're not physically equipped to lead and they need a superior human to 
uh, you know, exercise dominion over them. And I don't know, to me, it just seems like he's getting a little close to the arguments that slave owners used to use to justify slavery way back in the day. Mm. So, Indeed, well, just a strange way of looking at the world. Go on, Jay. Yeah, when I, when, when I, when I see stuff like that, when men have like, uh, it's, it's kind of a tale to me, because of course, like I said earlier, there's a certain pridefulness that, uh, that everybody has, not just governor body members. Like men in general, we have a certain pridefulness to whereas we'd like to be macho and stuff. And it kind of, it's a tale, you know, because the governor bodies, they shouldn't, they shouldn't feel this way. They shouldn't like look or, or try to feel this macho-ness, you know. But yeah, like you said, like, you know, Jesus was super strong and he was, you know, he could handle 30 people if he, if he needed to, you know. <laughs> and like, yeah, that's, that's unnecessary, bro. Like, <laughs> he did a lot of other things. Like, you don't really need to point that out. But it shows that he's, he's, he's enthralled by it. Like, it's on his mind. He's, he's thinking about it, and he probably would like to be a more macho person, you know? So, it's just, yeah, it's definitely something to think about. Hmm. And it's informed by the movies, apparently. Because what, <laughs> what was on the movies in the 1950s should inform how we view the world. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> when did Rambo come out? <laughs> that, that was the 1980s. Ah, okay, okay. I'm sure he enjoyed <laughs> that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that was his uh, what he was up to as a circuit overseer. So I think he spent about twelve years as a as a CEO there, and then he was appointed to be a district overseer in nineteen seventy seven. And he spent about twenty one years in the district work. And uh, so yeah, evidently at some point through here he became anointed and was a partaker, I guess. Um, and so. He was kind of, uh, he, he follows a very similar timeline actually to uh, Guy Pierce and Steve Lett. They all kind of got pulled off the road from the traveling work at the same time and started, um, you know, doing the thing in Bethel. Uh, so they, that was, yeah, August 97, they're pulled into uh, Bethel and initially the service department and uh, then the helper to the service committee of the governing body. And then in 1999 is when he uh, gets the call to join the governing body. Not, not quite the meteoric rise that we, we've perhaps seen with Kenneth Cook. More, more time spent, you could say, on the road to some degree. But just some interesting kind of stories along the way there. I'm, I'm just trying to think what, what we can say about his time actually on the governing body since 1999. Um, and again, we had a major insight into all of the governing body members from, you could say, October 2014 onwards when JW Broadcasting started. Um, all of a sudden, we're seeing these men in, in full HD on our screens. And even before then, I just got this impression of Sam Hurd being, how can I put this, fairly tedious to listen to. He, I think that... Um, and look, he can't help his age, but for the most part, when he's on camera, he looks like he doesn't want to be there. He's, not, he's kind of out of his comfort zone, and he's just making the best of a bad situation and trying to find his way through one way or the other. He's very glued to his notes. He's very glued to the auto cue. And again, just not a very compelling speaker. Would that be fair? I've always um, kind of noticed when ev when anybody who's a career Jehovah Witness, there always seems to be a time where they just kind of check out and they just stay in cruise control. And yeah. I think he may be the governing body version of that. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you could be a faithful witness your entire life, especially when you're young. But after a while, I, I it, it's consistent. People always hit that that like, okay, I'm just, I'm a, you know, I'm a melody in the day, you know, and that's probably the governing body version of that, you know, just like, all right, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still faithful. Mm. <laughs> Come on, hurry up. Let's wrap this party up. I'm ready to go, you know, and I think that's what it could be. I think the footage of him dancing um, last year in, in Brazil 
was kind of partly surprising, mainly because it was so, you could say, uncharacteristic of what we expect of Samuel Hurd. I mean, he, he looks most of the time like he's being kept alive on life support. And then <laughs> suddenly here he is animated in front of this crowd, um, probably buoyed on to some degree by, you know, the the situation he's in and the fact that he's receiving a degree of, of adulation. I mean, I covered all this in my dancing for Jehovah video, so I don't want to repeat myself too much, but um, yeah, there's, there's definitely a sprightly side to him, but I, I would agree with you, Jay, that for the most part, when he's in front of the camera or he's in front of an audience, he looks like he's just in cruise control, not really, you know, not really sincere and passionate about what he's talking about. Indeed, I would agree. Hmm. So let's move on to our next governing body member, alphabetically, Jackson Jeffrey, who is currently, uh, we are again making this video in 2020, which would make him 65, the same age, incidentally, as my dad. Uh, his father was, or is Ron, I don't know whether his parents are still alive, but father Ron, mother Estelle, here is a picture of Jackson interviewing his parents. Obviously, famously, the reason why he was called before the Australian Royal Commission was because he happened to be in Australia looking after, I think, his father at the time. And due to that, the Australian Royal Commission was able to use their powers to compel him to give evidence as a governing body member, <clears throat> despite quite some efforts being made to insist that he was really only a translator. Uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> which actually was, is, there's an interesting quote at the end of his life story. Um, he says, while I can no longer serve as a translator, that's in his <laughs> life story, I thank Jehovah that he allows me to remain involved in supporting the worldwide translation work. So quite an unfortunate quote in hindsight, if that was his way of, or his, his attempted means of getting out of the Australian Royal Commission. Obviously, we'll, we'll come to the Australian Royal Commission later. But his parents were Ron and uh, Estelle. He was born in 1955 in Queensland, Australia. He describes... Um, going to high school in Tasmania, and you meant I, you you'll remember that earlier I said that Samuel Heard managed to work in a needless piece of information that only really makes sense in the light of him trying to impress people. There's a similar piece of information in Jeffrey Jackson's life story where he says, in high school in Glenarchy. In the island state of Tasmania, I won several awards for academic achievement. <laughs> it's like, no, high school certificates, they're not really that impressive, Jeffrey, but okay, we're impressed. Um, I, I got an award for, uh, <laughs> for participation. <laughs> I got a trophy for participation. Uh, I got a, uh, a, I did 15 sit-ups in a row. Nobody else could do that. Uh, I got a certificate for that. Uh, I, I jumped the highest out of the class when nobody else could jump because their knees was hurting. Uh, I got a certificate for that. He, he does <laughs> seem... awards aren't important. He does seem keen on mentioning awards and certificates because when he's talking about beginning pioneering, he says, so with my parents' consent... I left school and started pioneering in January 1971 at the age of 15, having received the required school certificate. So, okay, okay Jeffrey, we get it. You like awards and certificates. Um, <laughs> I noticed he threw in the, at the end there about having several uh, books published as well. He does. He mentions that. Uh, maybe we can show viewers now he... He mentions at the end that he had a long personal project starting in 1979, uh, taking him about 20 years to compile a list of Tuvaluan words and their meaning. So you could say 
that of all of the governing body members, he's the only one who's actually a published author in, in terms of actual books that are useful to people. Um, so yeah, kudos to, I mean, obviously the whole reason why he did, why he did this project was as part of his work of trying to recruit people into a cult. Nevertheless, it could be argued that the knowledge from his research is transferable to other areas. So we'll give him marks for that. I like how he's like so upfront about all his achievements and how great he is. Yeah. But then when it comes to, you know, him talking to the Royal Commission, he's like, oh yeah, I'm not that great. I'm just a yeah. translator. I, I, I'm a translator. I, I know nothing about all of these rules that you're talking about. Yeah. Pretty much. Like, like, hey, aren't you the leader of like a code of 8 million people? Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, but you know. In a manner of speaking. <laughs> so, 1968, he's baptized in the Queensland outback. I would have loved footage of that. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm imagining the Queensland outback, like most outbacks in Australia, to be uh, rather, shall we say, hazardous in terms of animal wildlife that might approach one while in a body of water. Um 1971, January, he leaves high school and starts pioneering. He would have been uh, 15, I think, as it said there. Now, there's a date that he doesn't provide. Um, I don't know whether you are, are able to fill in the blank here, Phil, but he describes marrying Jenny Alcock and whereupon they special pioneered together, but he, he misses out the date of them getting married. I don't know whether you have that date. Mm, I don't think I caught that, no. Yeah, okay, that, that's fine. Um, 1979, January, uh, Jenny and Jeffrey uh, start a missionary assignment in Tuvalu, and he starts working on his 20-year uh, project, you could say. Uh, 1980, uh, Jenny and Jeffrey are assigned to work as translators for Tuvalu. In 1985... Uh, they are assigned to the Samoa branch. Uh, in 1996, they are assigned to the Fiji branch. So they're moving around the Pacific, as it were. And in 2003, they are both assigned to Patterson, New York, to work in translation services. And then in 2005, only two years later, quick work, you might say, uh, Jeffrey is appointed to the governing body. Wow. But, but this is to be followed by heartache in 2009 when his wife, Jenny, dies of breast cancer. Mm. Um, so after Jenny's death, Jeffrey marries his current wife, Lorraine. And I, I don't know, how would we summarize... How would we summarize Jeffrey Jackson's style, as it were, as a governing body member? Well, um, the, 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 most, the biggest takeaway from him is always going to be his appearance in the Royal Commission. You know, mm. him sitting there letting basically the world know that the governing body is not the only means of, you know, reaching God, you know? Yeah, he and, said it would be presumptuous to say exactly, that. that, that exactly. That, the governing body are the only ones who are representing God. Yeah. And do you see yourselves as Jehovah God's spokespeople on earth? Uh, that I think would seem to be quite presumptuous to, to say that uh, we are the only spokesperson that God is using. Uh, the, clear, the scriptures clearly show uh, that uh, someone can act in harmony with God's Spirit in uh, giving comfort and help in the congregations. But uh, if I could just clarify a little, going back to Matthew 24, uh, clearly Jesus said that in the last days, and Jehovah's Witnesses believe these are the last days, there would be a slave, a group of persons who would have responsibility to care for the spiritual food. So in that respect, uh, we view ourselves as trying to fulfill that role. That's going to be one of the biggest things that he's going to be remembered for. Mm. Uh, because there's so many people that I've talked to 
who said it was that moment that woke them up. Oh, to really? To hear a governing, a sitting governing body member state for the record that you know they're not the one. You know, it'd be presumptive to think that they were the only way to you know contact God. You know what I mean? So mm. I think with with everything else he's done, that's the biggest moment uh, in, as far as his career inside the governing body to me. Yeah. Would, would, would you agree with that, Phil? I, I would agree. Yeah, I, d- I guess he doesn't really stand out to me too much otherwise. But that, yeah, but that's really his defining thing, how, how cagey he was, which, which is kind of a uh, Jehovah's Witness tactic to use. But just mm-hmm. to, like Jay was saying, to see somebody, a governing body member, use it so openly is, mm-hmm. is something. I wasn't actually um, vlogging. Or I was vlogging, but I wasn't doing it as regularly at the time of the Australian Royal Commission. So rather than doing a video on on his testimony, I wrote uh, this JW survey article in which I went through the various half-truths and lies, because there were outright lies in his testimony as well. I mean, he may be a governing body member, but he's also an elder, and he gave wrong evidence to the Royal Commission um, to say that um, an inactive or faded Jehovah's Witness wouldn't get in trouble if they were openly celebrating Christmas, which he knows is wrong. I mean, he he has his own copy of the Shepherd book, or uh, it would have been the 2010 Shepherd book that he had access to at that time, and where it clearly says that celebrating false religious holidays is uh, an act of apostasy. So he knew that, but when it suited him, uh, when it was convenient for him, he, he misrepresented what it was all about. So it doesn't surprise me, Jay, when you say that his appearance before the commission um, had, had the unintended consequence of waking people up. And, and, um, I, and, and the argument that I hear JW use, because they know it's a lie too. They know it's an outright lie when he said the things that he said, like there's no consequence for leaving the organization. When... He, if, if you look at it, and I think it might have been your video I was watching, he's basically, oh, he's using theocratic warfare, mm. or he's, uh, he, he, he's using, he's playing semantics games, whereas uh, if you look at it, what he said was technically the truth, but if you go and you press any further, you know that there, there are, uh, you know, problems that come along with leaving, but it's, it's, it's problems that the other people have openly chosen to do unto other people. You know what I'm saying? Indeed. Like, uh, those things right there are, are the arguments that they give, but everybody knows that saw that video. And if you haven't saw it, you should check it out. Uh, he lied openly and quite easily. <laughs> like, it was not hard to do it. It looked like, I mean, it looked like he was like, he genuinely felt that way. I mean, I'm like, wait a minute. We, we lie that easily now? That's incredible. I'm just remembering as well, now that we're talking about Jeffrey Jackson, I think there was a JW broadcasting episode. And if I'm right, I'm going to put it in in post, a few clips in which he describes his health problems. When I look back over the years, I remember things that discouraged me and made me feel low. What were some of those difficult moments in my life? Well, I remember the time when, as a missionary, I nearly died of typhoid fever. I also remember supporting and caring for my first wife, Jenny, during her 10-year battle with breast cancer. Then also losing the sight in my left eye because of melanoma, a form of cancer. Losing close friends in death, including Jenny, sometimes one after the other in close succession. As a missionary, I had feelings of isolation. And then of course the frustration that comes because of my own mistakes and weaknesses and trying to find a balance between what I want to do and what I can actually do. All those things have at times discouraged me. And I know that many of you have faced far worse challenges. I did at one point think that perhaps out of all of the governing body members, he might be 
the most reasonable, the most likely to enact change. But since following a number of JW Broadcasting episodes that he's hosted, and obviously with his evidence before the commission, I now consider him to be one of the most devious and uh, and deceitful, if anything. Um, so that's Jeffrey Jackson, and that takes us to Rubberface himself. The face! The face, <laughs> Stephen Lett. Uh, so what have you got for us, Phil? Yes, the one and only. <laughs> and I did try and find out what the story is on his face. Uh, you know. <laughs> oh, really? You did, you did research on Stephen Lett's face. Now that is dedication. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's riveting. Uh, you can't help it. <laughs> Did you but, did you call up the the Jim Henson animatronics workshop and <laughs> ask if they had anything to do with? Uh... <laughs> did he study under Jim Carrey? <laughs> he, he broke the mold when he was born and in all the wrong ways. But, uh, <laughs> what do you have for us, Phil? Indeed, indeed. So uh, yeah, well, let's see. Uh, Mark, uh, Steve Lat. So his full name is actually Mark Stephen Lat. His his dad's name is Mark Lat. So he's technically a Mark Junior but he goes by his middle name, Steve. Um, But yeah, he was born in 1949. Uh, So let's see, I would put him, what, about 71 years old now. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then he has one younger brother, Tim Latt. So he was born in 51. And so I don't know exactly, uh, uh, but I mean, it sounds like they were raised as witnesses. Definitely by the time he graduated, they're very, you know, active witness family. Uh, they were down south. I think they were in Alabama. So he graduated around 66, and he kind of ran into the same thing that Sam Hurd did if the draft was going on. This was the Vietnam War now. And so he had a little more trouble, obviously, being a witness. Um, you know, they didn't let them do alternative service back in the day, back then. So he had to kind of try and be a, get a minister exemption. And to do that, the society said you had to either be a pioneer or a Bethelite. Um, and so that's, so that's what he did. He started pioneering after high school. And then he, uh, in 1967, he went off to Bethel. Um, and it was a pretty hefty, it was four year minimum back, back then you had to stay. And so that's, so he was there from 67 to 71. There was an interesting, uh, some posts I ran across. So, I mean, you know, you could take it with a grain of salt, but it was from a a witness woman that had been, she had gone to Bethel in 69. So two years after Steve did, and he was, um, she mentions he was her book study conductor back at that time in uh, Greenwich Village book study they were attending, according to what she said. So they'd all walk down there from Brooklyn. And uh, she mentions he was a partaker at that time from what she remembers. So that's kind of interesting if that's true, because that would have been only 20, 21 years old. Wow. <clears throat> so you started early there with the emblems. Indeed. And I guess I have heard that a little bit. These young guys will go to Bethel and they get this kind of spiritual high and think they're anointed for a few years. Hmm. But he, he <laughs> stuck with it. You go to Bethel, you're like, this is so, I think I'm anointed. <laughs> I, I always found that whole oh I'm anointed thing funny anyway because they would literally the 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 <laughs> the only thing that it takes for you to be anointed is to just wake up one day and say I'm anointed. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember hearing the talk where they said, you know, if you wake up and you question whether or not you are anointed, you're not anointed. You have to just wake up one day and be assured 100% positive that you're anointed and then boom, you're considered anointed. That's it. <laughs> I'd be interested to know what the breakdown of male anointed versus female anointed is because in Stephen Lett's case, you, ha- you can argue that there's, how can I put this? There's a potential ulterior motive when like a young book arrives in Bethel, if, if you want to kind of fast track to the governing body and you know that only anointed ones can be on the governing body, <laughs> you're, 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 there's clearly an incentive there for you <laughs> to, to reach this conclusion. <laughs> Whereas if you're a woman at Bethel, it doesn't make any difference, does it? It doesn't make any difference whatsoever. So I, I'd be interested to know 
whether there's a significant difference between the numbers of female anointed and the numbers of male anointed, you know? Do we know any of the uh, helpers, you know, like the people that really help the governing body, the speakers, how many of them are anointed? I would love to know. I wish, because they only recently started listing all the helpers on JW.org. And between you and me, I think that that had something to do with, on JW survey, we managed to find a leaked document naming all of the different departments and who the helpers were. And shortly after that, JW.org started listing all the names, almost like, okay, this information is now in the out, out, out of the box anyway. Let's start publishing it. Oh, I would they hate you, Lloyd. They hate <laughs> you guys so much. Oops. Um, but I, I'd love it if there was some kind of asterisk or something that said, where it said, you know, this brother is one of the anointed. They're clearly not going to do that, but it's still information that I would find very useful because then you would know basically who the potential candidates are. Um, so, so uh, Bethel Pimos, we need you to, um, if you could do your yes. best, <laughs> let's get those uh, anointed brothers out so we can, uh, you know, just <laughs> If, if you are Pimo them. in Bethel, or indeed if you happen to be in a congregation with a governing body helper, and you have inside knowledge to share as to whether they are or are not partaking of the emblems, we'd love to hear from you at JW Survey, and maybe we can start compiling this information for people. Very interesting stuff right there. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Phil, we, 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 we digress. <laughs> no, that's, that's great stuff. Yeah, so, uh, so that's, anyways, that's how, much, how long Steve was at Bethel, the four years. He, he did his time and uh, he got out in 1971. And uh, like, it sounds like most Bethelites back then, he got married almost immediately after leaving. And uh, we, we actually do have his uh, wedding uh, announcement from the newspaper. And so that gives us a little more info. Uh, his wife's name is Susan. Susan Lynn Camp was her maiden name. And so they were a family from uh, Alabama as well. So yeah, they were, so that was 71. And it mentions in the announcement that by that point, his parents and his brother were uh, evidently pioneering in Clarksville, Arkansas. So, uh, you know, they're doing their thing pre-1975. And that's what um, Steve and Susan did after they got married. They became special pioneers and so where you, where you find them is in Illinois the next few years, uh, Steve and Susan and then his parents were all special pioneers in rural Illinois up through 75. When, when Armageddon didn't come. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they had to change stuff up a little bit after 75, huh? I wonder why. <laughs> yeah, so that's the kind of the interesting thing. You see this, uh, this split in the road, so uh, uh, Steve and Susan keep special pioneering, but his parents, they kind of seem to pull the plug at that point. And I said, well, we, you know. That's we interesting. So they yeah. came off around after 1975, did they? Exactly in 1975. Oh, yes. that is Wait interesting. Wait a second. So are they, are they still witnesses or are they, are you saying they're dead? They can't still be alive, surely. Right. So Whoa. his dad, his dad's died in, I think, 86. Um, as a witness? As a witness, as far as I know. Yep. Yeah. So they still stayed witnesses and everything, but they kind of uh, gave up on the. <laughs> they eased off after eased off. the apocalypse didn't <laughs> they come. put off the gas a little yeah. bit, huh? Which is understandable. It must be Yeah, fair. false prophecy kind of has that effect. <laughs> if, if only... If only their son had uh, the same sort of wits about him. But, uh, <laughs> there we go. Indeed, indeed. Do you have any information on why he can't like blink fully? Like he never really fully blinks. Like he is like a half blink, like a lazy blink. <laughs> I, I, he does. I, what is that about? That is so weird. <laughs> it would be interesting to know how, I mean, his mannerisms on the platform are so contrived and I've even shared footage on, on the channel of when he gives like a behind closed doors talk to the audio video department. And it's almost like he just dials it down slightly from maybe a 10 to maybe like a seven or eight. It's, it's noticeable that he's just 
dropping it a little bit with the extreme kind of mannerism. So um, I'd Can be interested to know how... Away all the time? <laughs> What's that? Sorry. Could you imagine if that's how he always... Oh, you'd about? burn out, wouldn't you? If, yeah. if it was... If it was um, What's for dinner, honey? You know, you just... <laughs> yeah, it, it would be un, unsustainable to carry that kind of energy all through the day. Um, but I'd be interested to know what the evolution of his, um, his persona will be interesting. <laughs> Indeed. And on, on, on my channel, I, do, I did run across a couple of videos of his brother, Tim, because he, he, he got into the real estate business. And so there's stuff about him opening restaurants and whatnot. And his brother is is also a very uh, unique character. He looks pretty interesting, but n n definitely not the same mannerisms that Steve does. In fact, let me just show you some footage from of his brother, Tim. Well, there are 26 Civil War newspapers in the whole building. The actual newspapers, uh, a lot of history here. Running a restaurant is something new for Lett. Never have. I've built uh, condos and motels and a lot of homes, but I'm getting a learning experience. And the next time he's hungry? Hopefully I can come in and get a steak when I want to, you know? You hope so. If you only. It's interesting to see that facial configuration, but without the just crazy expressions. It's interesting that that might have been Stephen Lett, but something else happened. <laughs> I think the picture that's on your desk, Lloyd, best describes yeah. his face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I find myself watching your channel and looking at you, but I just can't stop looking <laughs> at that picture right there. I wonder who else does that, you know? It's interesting because usually when you're trying to find, when you're doing a thumbnail um, <laughs> of, that's of, of like a particular governing body member, you can't resist finding one where they look a little bit stupid. It's just, you know, come on, we, we get we get to, you know, diminish these men's power in, uh, in some way. Um, but with Stephen Lett, it's more a case of how do you find one where he looks normal? Because throughout the entire speech, his face is doing that. It, it would actually be a, more of a challenge to find, like, a frame of the video where he actually looks quite normal. But, uh, yeah. There's times where I'm editing video where I'm talking about Steve Lett. And you know how when you're editing, you don't really watch where you stop the video and you just look away and you're doing your edit. And then you just look back and you're like, that's the oh, dumbest face. Put that I away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Indeed. It's so funny you say that, uh, Lloyd, because I ran into the exact same thing trying to find a thumbnail for my videos about him. And I... <laughs> I did finally find like one frame with his where he was looking normal. <laughs> yeah. So you're actually more honest than I am, and I applaud that in you, Phil. <laughs> so yeah, that's so, his brother Tim. Indeed. So that was where uh yeah, so Tim and so Steve uh like you said, kept special pioneering in Illinois there. That's where he ran into the uh to Tim Mannion, uh Chessa Mannion's father. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, go on. Yeah, so uh, Steve was selling a car back then, uh, a Chevy Corvair, and uh, Tim ended up buying it from him. But oh, the he, governor body members got some nice cars, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a running theme, the isn't Cadillac. it? Nice, nice cars with uh, governing body members. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Tony had the Cadillac. I know uh, Sam had the drop top red convertible. <laughs> Me had the Chevy. Okay. But this is actually works. quite a quite an important story, isn't it? Because this came up in the Witnesses documentary, yeah, and yeah. it really provided a compelling insight into the sort of man he is, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did. I, I don't know how much detail you want to go into, uh, so just cut me off. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, so Steve, you know, of course, he was a good special pioneer trying to make his hours. And he started witnessing to Tim when they were doing the car sale. And so this was, I think, right in 75. So it was a pretty good message that, you know, the end might be coming that year. And so anyway, Steve started, uh, Tim started studying uh, and came, you know, got baptized. And um, eventually he got married and his whole family were witnesses. And he, Tim became an elder. Um, and yeah, so eventually 
the Mannion family, they kind of wanted to move where the need was greater in the, this was the early nineties. And so they moved out to this rural Illinois congregation from Chicago. And that's kind of where um, his daughter, Chessa, she was five years old. And so actually the night they got to their new hall, she was uh, sexually assaulted, raped by the son of one of the elders there. Uh, um, so that took a big toll on the, the whole Mannion family there. And but because so, of this connection with Stephen Lett, um, they, they assumed, you know, I, think, I think it's safe to say that this haunted Chess's father, didn't it? I think exactly, yes, mm. yes. So he, um, he eventually, so it was in 2002, the, there was a Dateline documentary about child abuse in Jehovah's Witnesses. And he saw that, and it was after he watched that, he wrote a, a long letter to his old Bible teacher, Steve Lett, who at this point was now, had joined the governing body a little earlier. And, you know, just kind of pleading with them, please, now that you're at the top, change the policies about how they handle child abuse. Um, and it's kind of interesting. You see in the documentary there that Steve did write back to Tim and, you know, kind of sympathized with everything they'd gone through, but did, he didn't really address changing the policies at all. He didn't all. address it at all, did he? He didn't address a single point that Tim had raised. It was such a politically correct right back, you know what I mean? Like it was at no point was there any real like emotion or, or just like even acknowledging what was going on and the mm. problem there. Not, not even a simple, I will look into it. I mean, mm. It was just, you know, pray to Jehovah and stay strong type of message. I mean, it, it's almost unhuman to hear a story like that, to see the passion in which somebody writes you and to not fully address it. That means you're thinking more about your position and protecting than you are actually doing for others. You know, that should be extremely telling. Yeah. And so it's kind of, it, it, as Chessa tells her story, that they, they, the Manians did initially press charges against the guy, but then a little while later, they dropped the charges because, you know, the whole machinery of the society about not bringing reproach on Jehovah's name kicked in. And so that makes it really interesting what that, was it 2015, uh, when Steve Lett was on video talking about the, you know, pedophiles within the organization and he called them uh, ah, apostate-driven yeah. lies. Apostate-driven lies and dishonesties. Here is the footage. Think about the apostate-driven lies and dishonesties that Jehovah's organization is permissive toward pedophiles. I mean, that is ridiculous, isn't it? If anybody takes action against someone who would threaten our young ones and takes action to protect our young ones, it's Jehovah's organization. We reject outright such lies. Just astonishing denialism, isn't it? It is. It's really striking when you know the background. Yeah, because and I'm glad you brought that up because I completely didn't even put those two things together. Not only would he say something like that, but he said that while fully knowing that he had a personal connection to an event like that. Mm. Not to mention all the blue letters he probably received. I'm not sure if the governor body are actually looking at them or reading them or if they just filing them all off. But he had firsthand knowledge of a situation and still had the nerve to get in front of everybody and just put it off as apostate driven lies. Mm. That, that is crazy to me. Yeah. These guys have a grandstand view of what's going on. Uh, arguably the same it's, it's hard to make the same argument for previous governing body, uh, governing bodies. Uh, but certainly since all of the scrutiny beginning in 2001, 2002, I mean, they, they're not doing their jobs, frankly, if they don't know the extent to which the organization's covering up abuse. And again, uh, Chester's story really highlighted the, the personal involvement of, of one governing bent governing body member in understanding the story and knowing about it but doing nothing and arguably Stephen Lett's indifference and failure to engage contributed it could be argued to uh, Tim's death 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, have we kind of filled in from when um, Stephen Lett was doing special pioneering in 1975 to when he was appointed to the governing body? Would that be worth just... Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. So he he uh, special pioneered uh, until 79, and then he and his wife started in the circuit work, and they did that about 19 years. Um, and then, yeah, and then it was in... Um, 1998 April they're pulled off the road into Bethel and kind of the same deal it goes in the service department mm -hmm. helper to the teaching committee of the governing body and then uh, October 99 he was announced along with um, Sam Hurd and uh, Splane and Pierce the, to join the governing body. So uh, I, I, I actually didn't pick up on the fact that he was in the service department um, it's interesting that Mark Sanderson was also um, a former service department worker. And of course, the service department is the gateway, really, for dealing with child sex abuse. So if you're, if you're working in the service department, you're literally receiving the, um, is it S77 forms? I can't think of what they're called now. Um, you're receiving the notice of disfellowshipping forms through. You're inputting the information into the database. You're following a procedure. You're in contact with, you, you literally have elders ringing through to the service department saying, I've got a pedophile. What do we do? What do we do? And you're involved in giving the advice. So it's, it's interesting that, again, Stephen Lett involved in, on the front line in this as we're going to find out, Mark Sanderson will have been, because he too worked in the service department. Uh, but in, in at least Mark Sanderson didn't go on camera and say it's all apostate-driven lies and dishonesties, as Stephen Lett did. Mm. Sam Hurd also, he was in the service department. Oh, was he really? We missed that one. Okay, my bad. <laughs> um, I'm starting to see more and more people in the service department that are uh, anointed. Is that a... Uh, a, a, a necessary step to get to the service department? Well, it, it's, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about um, the correspondence uh, which uh, Ken Cook was involved in. Again, it's, you're in a situation where you are deflecting criticism and you are seeing the very worst of the organization in the kind of feedback you're getting from people writing into the organization. That's, that was the case with Kenneth Cook. Um, and with Stephen Lett and Sam Hurd, we have a situation again where they're seeing the ugliest side. I mean, we're talking about like lifting up the rock and seeing all the creepy craw crawlies un un underneath when you work in the service department. That describes Stephen Lett and Sam Hurd. We're seeing, I think, uh, a theme, aren't we, of, of what it takes to be appointed to the governing body. You have to see to some degree, the organization at its very worst and be okay with it. You know, it reminds me, I, I, I don't know if you remember that part of when you, uh, the Watchtower, uh, well, no, not the Watchtower, uh, the show called The Witnesses, right? The documentary. Yeah. There was a part in there where they were having a deposition with, I believe, an elder or somebody. And they were saying, um, well, you know, can't you just look up um, like, uh, I, I, it, it states my mind at the moment exactly the wording, but I just remember him saying in response, well, you know, we can't really do that because we'd pull up, you know, like people who committed murders, people who are like drug dealers and all these other crimes and stuff. And I'm like, uh, that shouldn't stop you from looking up pedos. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it was that Richard Ash. Going on? It was Richard Ash who was, um, being questioned in a lawsuit um, about the database and and how it might be how it might, how they might be able to divulge the information if they wanted to and uh, yeah he was jumping through hoops to stop that information from being divulged and before um, the lawyer could stop him from talking he started to divulge the things that were inside of that database mm -hmm. how did that not send up everybody's antennas like like well you know inside of there we have murderers and drug dealers and we're like whoa wait a minute mm -hmm. 
why is that criminal why is evidence? That, exactly. Criminal why evidence is being the, F, the, the FBI team? going to kick in their door like immediately? Indeed. So how we've summarized the um, governing body role or or notable kind of characteristics for Cook, Heard, and Jackson, apart from the uh, you could say denialism over child sex abuse, how uh, and the ridiculous facial expressions. Um, how would we how would we describe Stephen Lett's uh, history as a governing body member? I would have to say he is a very charismatic and passionate speaker. I I think one of the things about him is that his voice is everywhere. Like my father used to have some of those, uh, the Bible readings on tape. And he, when he would play it, a lot of the times it would be uh, Stephen Lett, whose voice it was that was reading the Bible or telling the story. So I, I remember not even really knowing what the governing body looked like because, you know, it was before the internet and stuff like that. But I would see his, I would hear his voice all the time. And even though he would be at an assembly, I, I never really remembered people's faces. You know, I could, I always sat in the back of the assembly. Like we could never really get there early enough to get the upfront seats. So I could only kind of barely see his face. You know what I mean? So I never was able to really put a face with the voice but I remember him being the voice of almost everything as far as like the, the, the tapes and stuff we had uh, coming up at the Jehovah Witness. I think that's probably uh, one of the biggest takeaways from his uh, time as a governor body member. Phil, what are your overriding thoughts of, of his uh, history as a governing body member? Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with Jay. He's a, kind of a folksy sort of guy when he's talking uh he has that southern accent um but it, yeah it's just interesting to contrast the talks he gives versus what we know about his life i don't know if you wanted to get into like the real estate stuff versus yeah you did mention this in your in your latest one of your latest videos and you, you i think you mentioned in the email that you had some updates to some of the information you've presented so by all means what what can we say about his real estate? Um... Yeah, well, just, you know, there's a lot of records down there from Alabama, and his family was really into real estate development after the 70s there. And, um, and you do see Steve himself pop up every now and then in the records, getting involved in little deals. And in 2013, there was a really interesting one where he goes in on a a uh, half a million dollar waterfront property with his, with his brother, Tim. Um, it's kind of an investment property down there. And it's just really interesting. Like, I don't know. I mean, you could say, well, maybe his, his brother just put his name on there because he's a nice guy. And maybe Steve didn't invest 250 grand into that. But it's just so interesting that he has, that he's dabbling in that when you consider some of the talks that he's given about you know, the needing to donate and the shortages of funds that witnesses should make up. Well, I would argue that there's more to it than that. I mean, whether or not he actually put up the half a million or quarter of a million, sorry, um, he is, apart from being a governing body member, he's a Bethelite. Same argument I made for this guy when he got caught splashing cash on expensive booze. Um, apart from being a governing body member, these men are Bethelites and they are members of the worldwide order of full-time servants of Jehovah or whatever it's called. And they have to take a vow of poverty. And you're not telling me that this vow allows, number one, spending nearly a grand on whiskey in one, in one go or being involved in expensive real estate transactions. If, if this rule can apply to Stephen Lett or to Tony Morris in the Bottlegate uh, case, then it should also be applicable to all Bethelites. In other words, that how how is there a, a vow of poverty applicable to ordinary Bethelites that somehow doesn't apply to the governing body? And if the rules on the vow of poverty are being flexed so much that he can be involved in real estate to the extent he is, in what other areas is the vow of poverty being 
you could say, skewed in their favor? It seems pretty easy to do. Because <laughs> even with Tony, I mean, they, they, they find a way to argue it away. Like, there's always a, another reason as to why it's okay. Oh, you know, they're, they're, they, he gives them away. He gives the bottles away because there's some type of event going on. I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> or, and, and I'm sure he's like, oh, well, maybe, you know, I put my name on it, but it's for the organization. Or, you know what I mean? Like, there's always an, a, a, a scapegoat, you know, something that they can say to make it okay. You know, I've always noticed that. Yeah. Do, do you find that interesting, Phil? I mean, I'd, even if you find a way for this to be all above board and witnesses watching this could say, well, he, as long as he's not breaking the law of what business is it to anyone, nevertheless, these guys are Bethelites. They've, they've taken a vow of poverty. What does that vow of poverty actually mean if they can be involved in real estate transactions? Uh, right, exactly. Yeah. And I mean, you do hear stories over the years of, uh, Bethel, you know, rank and file Bethel guys. Uh, I think do they call it G jobbing, where they kind of do weekend jobs to mm -hmm. earn a couple hundred bucks, and uh, and the society seems to crack down <laughs> pretty hard on that periodically. So yeah, it's just funny. There's kind of two different standards for the at the top. Indeed, well, that's what it boils down to. It's double standards. It's you could say corruption. It's one rule for ordinary Bethelites. It's another rule entirely for the governing body. And again, if they can bend the rules when it comes to real estate ownership, um, what other rules are being bent? What, what is it? I, I'd be fascinated to know what, what we don't know. And, and arguably, when it comes to the governing body and all the ins and outs of their lives and the decisions they've made, we will never fully know. But I, I'd love to know even a percentage of what goes on, you know? <laughs> Oh, you and I both would know it. I would love to know what Tony Morris Knights is like. <laughs> I want to know exactly how many glasses get poured and what he watches on TV. <laughs> in, in all seriousness, if he can be that sloshed on a on an annual meeting platform, goodness knows what state he's in when it gets to like nine, ten o'clock in the evening. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, but as far as my thoughts on Stephen Lett are concerned, obviously we've dealt with the child sex abuse. Um, we've, we've dealt with his kind of approach to apostates and what have you and his facial mannerisms and all that kind of thing. I guess for me, keeping a close eye on his kind of JW broadcasting appearances, what I, what I find most obnoxious about him is his kind of vampirish obsession with young ones. And how encouraging it is to see young ones getting baptized, publicly demonstrating that they are giving their lives to Jehovah. And we sincerely hope that you young ones who are not yet baptized will not hold back from getting baptized as soon as you qualify. The sooner you can get baptized, the sooner you will receive greater protection and blessings from Jehovah. Not long ago, it made me very happy to observe a little 10-year-old brother get baptized. And young ones, never be afraid to identify yourself as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, first of all, he hates children. There's, there's been multiple comments where he said that basically children are greedy and selfish. They are, they, are innate, they are innately greedy and selfish. And only when they are trained with the new personality, with, with spiritual qualities, do they suddenly become young ones, at which point they can be useful to the organization. Mm -hmm. And he's had uh, at least two of his... JW Broadcasting um, episodes have been dedicated specifically to manipulating young people to becoming, not just becoming Jehovah's Witnesses, but to serving the organization to the best of their ability. And on the one hand, you could argue, well, the guy is, what, now 71 years old. 
he's not going to be reaping the benefits of many of the young ones he's encouraging to come forward. But in, in a way, I don't know, I, I just find it so disturbing the way he exploits children, which is what it all amounts to. It's one thing to try and persuade adults to follow you. It's another thing entirely to, to knowingly exploit the child, the childhood innocence and, and the way that young people are susceptible to coercion. He seems to be, out of all of the governing body members, far and away the worst when it comes to that, in my view. One of the first times I actually sat back and my stomach actually kind of churned was when I noticed that they were doing these Caleb and Sophia videos. That moment right there, I, I it, it turned my stomach, you know? Mm. And they've done some bad things, but it was something about them having this propaganda cartoon aimed at babies. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was something about that that really just like, oh, it was like a knife in my gut and turned, you know what I mean? Because this was just straight up outlandish adult content breaking down and given to children. Mm. And, and I mean, I remember the first one I saw because I, I left the organization before they, they really got internet heavy. Like when I left, they were still saying like, oh, you know, the internet is bad. You know, <laughs> I remember that quite vividly. But when they got to the point where they started making these highly animated, I mean, really expensive cartoons aimed at children, that's what really like, like, like just, oh, it gutted me. So I'm like, ah, oh. and I know Sam, I know Steve don't like kids, you know? Mm. So, I mean, for, for him to even give the green light on something like that, oh my God, it, 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 it's the most gross thing, one of the grossest things I've ever seen. I guess if there's anything in addition to his, again, vampirish tendencies towards children that kind of stand out for me, it's the fact that he's sort of the go-to presenter. Bear in mind that Stephen Lett is also on the teaching committee. And as such, you could say that he and the other teaching committee members almost seem to get first dibs when it comes to, who, to, when it comes to presenting information on videos. And indeed, Stephen Lett was the very first governing body member to give a JW Broadcasting um, episode. And it just seems that he is the Mr. Fix-It when it comes to making appeals of a financial nature. And the May 2015 JW Broadcasting episode, of course, was the notorious one where he basically put his hand out and for the first time on video said, you know, there's a shortfall here. Um, we, we need you guys to donate money. That was, that was a pretty big deal, I think, at the time, wasn't it? Yeah, that was really something to see. I guess I remember there always seemed to be like one service meeting part at the end of each year that would talk about ways you could donate. But yeah, to see him up there so explicitly uh, begging, I think you could say, was, yeah. was really something. It was. And it's, it was extra crazy to me because I remember a lot of the points we'd make to other people when we'd be out of field service is that we don't pass a collection plate around. We don't ask for money. We're 100% donation based and people give out of the kindness of their heart. We don't ask for money. I remember saying that at the door so many times. I remember hearing that over the stage so many times. So it was a, a big shock to actually hear them ask for money. Like, whoa, I'm like, when, when do we get to this part of the conversation? I don't remember that. <laughs> Where did that come from? Yeah, that was pretty, pretty incredible. So I think unless you guys have anything else to add, I think we've pretty much covered the main highlights from Stephen Lett's life and career as a governing body member, would you say? Or is there any, anything else you wanted to add? I just really like uh, just learning more about him after hearing his voice. I, I, I knew his voice way before I knew his face but his face is far more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a given, yeah. Um, but yeah, we've, we've gone through four of the eight governing body members and in fairly decent time. So we will, we will try this again um, in part two, in which, good grief, I, don't even, I can't even think. So we'd be doing Tony Morris, wouldn't we? 
we'd be doing Mark Sanderson. Garrett Loesch. Garrett Loesch, correct. And who's the, the who, who are we missing? Oh, uh, Splain. Splain. Yeah. Yes. He's, yeah. he's, he's the best at uh, speaking down to people in a very patronizing way. So <laughs> explaining things to people with his, uh, with his whiteboard. <laughs> So we, there's plenty of material <laughs> between, particularly between um, Splain and, and Morris, although I'm sure we'll have something to say as well on Mark Sanderson and Garrett Loesch. But guys, it's been an absolute delight having you on the channel. And thank you so much for all of the comments and certainly, Phil, for your research. I really do appreciate it. Oh, hey, this was fun to talk about these guys. Hey, thanks, Phil, man. You're the greatest. <laughs> <laughs> Again, if you haven't yet checked out Phil's YouTube channel, it is Blue Envelope, and I'll be putting a link in the description. Phil's done some fantastic research on governing body members, which I, I think it's safe to say is ongoing, Phil. Yes, yes. I, I, after I, I get burned out from each one, but once my juice recharges, I hit the next one. <laughs> Are you able to tell us who the next one is, the next one in line? Well, I have bits and pieces on, on Ken Cook. I'd like to find out maybe more than what we've even talked about, if there's anything. So Absolutely. So, so stay tuned to Phil's channel for a more in-depth look at Kenneth Cook. But that's pretty much everything we've got for you. Um, I hope you found this video an interesting resource. We look forward to doing part two together. But for now, that's everything we have. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.